Well, we are uh, kind of continuing. We've been talking the last three weeks about the afterlife, about death, heaven, so forth, dying. And so uh, today we're, we're kind of continuing the, uh, the theme of the afterlife, and we're looking at some um, the, the rapture, some of the things concerning the rapture. Uh, next week we will actually we'll look at two things. I, I told you that we're going we're gonna to look at the, um, uh, the millennial kingdom and then the, uh, the um, new heaven, new earth. Um, I've decided I'm going to put those two together next week because the Lord is laying on my heart as we kind of come down to those last few sermons, uh, some things I, I, I want to share with you. But today, we're, we're again, we're getting into the, uh, the rapture. This morning, I was reading through a, a book, one of my books, and, and, uh, and, as, and I read this. I thought it was very interesting. It said, eschatology is not designed to satisfy curiosity. This is not on the, your board. Uh, it's, it's not designed to satisfy curiosity, but to provide an intelligent comprehension of the future as a guide for a present program and a sure ground for hope. I thought that was a great statement. I, 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 as I've said before, I'm really concerned about young pastors. And that's one of the things I hope to do when I retire is to help young pastors. Uh, but one of the things I'm concerned that I see in the pulpit today, and I think it's largely because of a lack of training, and that is the teaching on eschatology. It is not, we're not studying eschatology so we can be impressive when we talk to other people about theology in the end times. We're studying eschatology because it has great ramifications and implications for our life right here on this earth. And so uh, that's why we do this. Uh, and today we're talking about the rapture. And I, I love the story. I've told it five or six years ago. It's a story of William Pettingill, and he, he told the story that he, one time he visited a friend who was at a steel plant, and this friend was a Christian, and the owner, in fact, he was a devoted Christian, and the owner motioned as they kind of walk, were walking the grounds, the owner uh, motioned for uh, the operator of an um, electric crane um, to come over, and he, then, Petting, then he said to Pettingill, he said, watch. And so he motioned for the, the guy who had this electric crane, which had, by the way, a giant magnet at the bottom of it, and he, at the pool, and, and he said, hit the switch. And he, once he hit the switch, all the metal that had been embedded in the road from trucks going back and forth just psh, came out of the ground. And of course, that's a picture, that's a great picture. He, he, certainly the owner was thinking of the rapture, no doubt. Well, the Bible makes it clear that the believer who lives during this age will be raptured. The question is today, more and more the question, used to be really uh, for a long time, there's no doubt about when he would rapture his church. Now there's more and more that's kind of muddying the water. But I'm, I'm with Solomon. There's nothing new under the sun. And so today the question is when and why? Why will he come when he will come? Our, no doubt our Lord will rapture his church. We who are of the same nature, and me, meaning of the eternal nature, will be raptured. And he will call us up, pull us up, catch us up, however you want to say it, uh, to meet him in the air. Uh, the, the, rap, the, the best place to begin is really with the word rapture itself. Uh, and you can start turning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to go there first. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, the, the word for rapture in the Greek is harpezo. Harpezo. It means to snatch or to catch away. It was used, it was our, in fact, our Lord, it was used of our Lord snatching away Philip. Remember, Philip was uh, speaking to and he baptized the eunuch. Well, right after that, it says Philip was snatched away. He found himself in another place. It was also used... And of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 and 4, when it speaks of him being called up into paradise. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, what perhaps the most familiar passage, the one that we often go to when it comes to the rapture of the church, 
is verse 16. And some of this whole section, really. But let's just read verse 16, and then let me comment. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, I want you to notice that the word with is used three times in that passage. Now, the word with in the Greek text is the word in, and it really means in or in conjunction with. So if I were to literally translate this in the Greek text, I would say in connection with a shout, in connection with the voice of the archangel, in connection with the trumpet of God, the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Now, if you go back and look at the previous verses, verses 14 and 15, we read, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. In other words, those who have died. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Here it states that he will bring with him, that is, his children, and at the same time those who have died will precede those who are called up into the air. The Thessalonian believers were concerned. They thought that the fact that they had, they thought they, if they die before Christ comes back to rapture the church, that they wouldn't go either. And so Paul wrote this to uh, uh, lay their concerns, their fears. Now, he was saying basically our bodies are like tents. But when these tents are torn down... God gives us another tent. It's kind of like something that's a couple of things that are with us every day uh, that are a big part of our life. They're computers and phones, right? And computers may not be with us when we're sleeping, but phones are around somewhere, right? Well, there's an analogy that you can use there. The computers are made up of two things, hardware and software. Everybody knows that. Hardware, of course, is the equipment, the thing, the mother, motherboard, and all those other things that make it run. But it's the programs that tell it how to run. Now, how many have had a computer to break down on you? Yeah, we've all had computers to basically die, right? And so, that, but you can take those programs, if you have the license to them, you can take those programs and put them into another computer, right? And so, that's what he's saying. Our bodies are like the old computers. They're wearing out. But God takes our soul and our spirit and it's transformed and put into another tent, another body, whether it be in heaven, whether it be in the millennium, whether it be in the new Jerusalem. We have, we'll have a new body. That's the point here. Now, the issue is when does it, the rapture occur? And there's a lot of discussion out there today about, post-trib, about a post-trib view, and about another view I'll share in just a moment. But there are three predominant views. I'll just review them. The pre-tribulational rapture uh, believes that Christ will rapture his church prior to the tribulation. The tribulation begins, by the way, when the Antichrist signs a covenant with the nation of Israel. Then there's a mid-tribulational view, and that is the one that believes that Christ will rapture his church right in the middle, three and a half years into the tribulation. And then there's a post-tribulational rapture, which believes that he will rapture his church at the end of the tribulation. Basically, the view is, is there is that Christ will, will base at the end of the tribulation, will come down, rapture his church, go back up, and then have the judgment seat of Christ, and then come back down, and, and that would be his second advent, his return. There's a problem, major problems with that. And so there's another view that has kind of taken its place. It's called the pre-wrath rapture. Now, the view of the, this view basically was made famous, you might say, by a man by the name of Marvin Rosenthal. Marvin Rosenthal was director of the Friends of Israel, uh, once they changed his view, he obviously was in contradiction to their doctrinal statement, and so he was let go. 
Uh, but that view actually has been around for a long time. It was really goes back to 1970. There's a man by the name of Robert Van Kampen, and he called this the three-quarters rapture. Now, the essence of this view is that the rapture will take place between the halfway point of the tribulation and the end of the tribulation, about five years, five and a third, something like that, five and a half years into the tribulation. Um, basically, their view is that three fourths into the, that the church basically will go through three fourths of the tribulation, and the reason they say that is because the church is promised that they will not experience the wrath of God. They hold the view that the all the all that takes place in the first half of the tribulation is the wrath of man and the wrath of Satan. Uh, there's but there are a lot of problems with that. They espouse the viewpoint that the rapture uh, timing of the sealed judgments are the wrath of man and wrath of Satan. And then they so hold that the, the trumpet judgments, as well as the bowl judgments that go later on, that those, that when they, they begin, the first one, the, that's when the wrath of God comes. And so they say the church has promised that they would not go through would not experience the wrath of God. Now, I, I want to just take a sh not too much time, but I don't want to bore you to death, but I want to take some time to show you just some fallacies of, of this, this viewpoint. One of Mar uh, Rosenthal's arguments is that the word thalipsis, the word thal thalipsis is a Greek word which means tribulation or affliction. He argues that it's only used 20 times. The Greek word's only used 20 times in the New Testament. Wrong. It's used, I wish these guys would learn how to read Greek. Wrong. It's, it's used 45 times at least in the book of tribute, in, in the book of the New Testament. His argument is that it's never used in the second half of the tribulation. Well, that's not true either. Because Matthew 24, the word is used, in that Matthew 24, no doubt, in terms of the chronology of that chapter, is speaking of the first part of the tribulation. So, here's another problem with that, with their view. The church will have to, if you go with this, the church will have to endure the, uh, the persecution of the Antichrist. His basic thesis is that the church will not escape all the oppression of the tribulation period, but will escape the wrath of God, which will be poured out during the second half of the tribulation. I've said that. Num again, there are major problems with this view. Since the Antichrist, according to Rosenthal, must appear first, the church is no longer watching and waiting for Christ, but for the Antichrist. Moreover, even after the Antichrist takes control of the earth, the church cannot look for Christ until she has suffered considerably under the wicked one. If the church must remain on the earth to face the Antichrist, then Christians would have to refuse to take on the mark of the beast or to worship the beast, his image. And as a result, the, the book of Revelation clearly tells us that all those who do not do that will be put to death. And if you were to look at chapter 13, we, we don't have time. We've got so many verses I'm going to give you. We'll write these down. In, in Revelation 13, verse 7, and then 15 through 18, we're told that the Antichrist will take control of all the earth and of all the people, and all the people will be subdued by him. So think about that. That it would seem, if that's the case, that the church, Christ's bride, must have to be removed for the Antichrist could not make war with and overcome Christ's bride, the church, against whom our Lord said, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Is the Lord correct or not? Another one, I'm just going to mention this because you know this, but it's the blessed hope. In, in, in Titus chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, it says, Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Now, what, you see that? And the appearing. Now, if you were to look back in verse 12, don't go back. But verse 12, he clearly is talking about, he uses the, the phrase something like this. This age 
And then he says, and looking for the blessed hope. So clearly he's talking about our Lord coming back at some point. And it has, it, clearly it, is, it has to be the rapture here. Now, it, so if the church goes through the first three quarters of the tribulation, where is the blessed hope in that? I mean, is there any hope? In, no. Here's another one. Again, I could preach a whole message on this, on this, but I don't want to bore you stiff. I'm going to get to the proofs of the free tree of rapture here. Okay. But number four is the first seal judgments in the first half of the tribulation. Remember, they say that the judgments in the first half of the tribulation are man's and Satan's, but not God's wrath. However, if you look closer, the scripture states that the la- it is the Lamb who opens the judgments. If it's the Lamb, of whom could it speak? Only of Christ, right? No. In fact, it says in chapter 5 of, of, of Revelation that no man is found worthy to open them except the Lamb. So it would seem to me that these are not man's judgments or Satan's judgments, but it's God's judgments, clearly. The tribulation begins when Jesus opens up the, I should say the real tribulation, the, 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 the difficult things that happen. It opens the first, Jesus opens the first seal and then there it comes. And what happens is that you have seven, seven different, you have three sets of judgments it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then out of the seven comes the next, and that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and out of the last seven comes the last three, uh, seven judgments. Now, one thing that I really think, and I want you to turn with me to Matthew 24. This is really where I think the, the uh, post-trib as well as, as, um, as pre-wrath rapture people really kind of drop the ball. And even pre-trib people sometimes drop the ball here. But it's the question about the elect in Matthew 24. One of the weaknesses of the pre-wrath rapture position is the presumption that the elect here refers to the church, believers from the church. But there's one dead giveaway. A couple things first. When Jesus gave his Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, He was talking to the Jews, and he was talking about the tribulation. Now, why? Remember, keep remember, the tribulation is, another name for it is Jacob's troubles. Another name for it, though, is, out of the book of Daniel, say it, the 70th week of Daniel, of the judgment upon the Jews. So the Tribulation is primarily for the, for the Jews that they would come back to their Savior. Now, Gentiles will receive Christ in that. But two-thirds of the Jews in the tribulation will die. And so, clearly, it speaks of the elect here. Um, and the elect is not the church. It shows, if you hold the view that it's the church, to me it shows how naive you are of the biblical words. Because the elect word is used in a different word, of course, in the Hebrew, but also in the, in the Septuagint, in the Greek, in the Old Testament. Now think about this for a moment. If you were a Jew and you heard the word elect referred to you, you would immediately refer back to the Hebrew words that say, you are my chosen one, which are used numerous times, not even to speak of the Septuagint, in which this word is used. So if you were a Jew and you're hearing this, what would you think? Would you think of the church? The church is not, it, it has not even come into existence. Why would you think of the church? The Lord hinted at times in, during the, in the Gospels about the church, no doubt. But the church had not been really identified. Paul called it a mystery. That which was hidden in the past but now has been revealed. Now, let me give you some other hints that should kind of give it away, okay? In verse 20... It says, pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a, what? Sabbath. Is the church told today to obey the Sabbath? No. No, we're not. What about verse 15? It says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of uh, through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. What is the holy place? 
What is it? It's the temple. And the temple is going to be rebuilt during the tribulation. It's going to be rebuilt. In fact, they're going to institute sacrifices during, during the uh, tribulation. We have no idea what goes on in the temple. And so clearly he has to be referencing the Jews here. Look in 31. It says, And he will get, send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from uh, one end of the sky to the other. Now, people look at that and say, that's got to be the church. And, no, it's not. Again, he, mentions, he says he mentions the trumpet. That's what he mentions over in, in 1 Thessalonians. Um, here's what you need to know. The, Jew, the use of a trumpet or trumpets were constantly, were constant, in fact, a, a mainstay of the Jewish people and calling them to a solemn assembly or calling them to anything. It was used in the Exodus. Uh, so the word trumpet in itself doesn't, it's sim- simply because it's used here and it's used in 1 Thessalonians 4, does not mean that it's one of the same event. That, that you need to understand that. Uh, if, you, if you look at, at the end of, um, of course, here's how they, they, they get, they go to verse 40, uh, and they say there will be two men in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, and one will be taken, one will be left. Again, I've told you many times, I'm not going to belabor the point. This is not a reference to the rapture, it's a reference to the judgment of the Jews that will take place at the end of the tribulation. How do I know that? If you read on in verse 42 through, 40 through 51, Jesus is talking about judgment, the separating in verses in chapter 25 through uh, 13. He's talking about judgment. It's the judgment of the Jews. He's still talking to the Jews. And then verses 14 through uh, to the end of uh, 30, he's talking about judgment. He doesn't stop talking to the Jews or referencing the Jews until you get to chapter 25, verse 31. Actually, verse 32. It says, and all the nations will be gathered before him. He didn't say Gentiles. He said all the nations. That's Gentiles. At the end of the tribulation, there will be two judgments to determine who among those who are living, keep that in mind, who are living will be transferred into the into the millennium those and so the ones that are taken are taken in judgment and by the way it says as it was in the days of noah now people many people say well see the noah and his family were brought into the 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 ark and they were thus delivered that great picture of the rapture it would be but that's not the context it's context 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 he talks he's talking about those who are living ungodly lives we were told in genesis for 125 years god strived with the people there but their ungodliness uh, was repulsive to god and so he brought a flood to judge the wicked world at the time so clearly he's talking about the judgment of the jews now enough of that i could could go on that with uh, as far as uh, kind of debunking uh, a pre-wrath rapture. Uh, Again, there's a lot more we could go through, but I don't want to bore you today with that. I want to give you the the proofs of of the the return, the rapture of the church at at the before the tribulation. And uh, and this again is to encourage you to know that there's something waiting for us one day. This Tuesday, I will stand at the graveside with reader at his graveside and I'll say this body we lay it will place it to rest but one day it's coming back out of that grave and it's going to be rejoined with the soul, soul, his soul and spirit and it will be changed and it will be transformed and transfigured that's the great promise we have and that's I'm referencing the rapture so what are the proofs of the pre-tribulational rapture First is the issue of imminency. 
Imminency is a belief that he could come at any time. It means there's no ev- events of necessity that has to occur prior to his coming to the rap- uh, co- coming as far as the rapture is concerned. Remember, now if, it, if, it, if we're thinking about if the rapture is at the end of the tribulation, then there are a lot of things that have to occur. And there are a lot of things that we're told to look for, but that's not the case. And I would add, too, that there's been some discussion about whether the early church fathers really believed that. They did. There were some who did. Look, the early church fathers had, had, were a mixed bag of beliefs as far as the return of our Lord or the rapture of the church. But they all, most, many of them, most of them, I would say, believed in the imminent return or rapture of the church. Here's one, for example. This was uh, by a, 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 really a man of the church. His name was Ephraim of Syria. Uh, and, and he lived during 370, well, actually he lived from seven, uh, 370, no, 306 A.D. to 373 A.D. And he said this, for all the saints and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord lest they see the confusion that is overwhelmed uh, is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. And there are a number of the quotes that, that are out there by this man who was a great scholar. He was of the, he was of the uh, Byzantine Eastern Church. He was a highly respected scholar during that time. Uh, they, they said that his work was really not translated until just the last, in the last century, I guess you'd say, last hundred years. There are many signs that were given to Israel which would precede the second advent of the return of Christ. So that nation would be living in expectancy when the time of his coming is close at hand. And even though Israel could not know the day or the hour when the Lord would return, they still could know that the time is certain, certainly near through the fulfilling of these signs. Go to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Join me at verse 25. It says, There will be signs in, in, in sun and moon and stars and on the earth, dismay among the nations and perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectations of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then they will see. Then they will see. You follow that? They will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So, see, they would be able to to detect the signs. In fact, that was the idea of what uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24 when he says, the sign of the fig tree. And people make all kind of things out of that, analogies out. The fig tree was simply, he he was referencing a fig tree. I grew up with three fig trees in my yard. And my dad would sometimes say, we're going to have a good year this year with our figs long before it was summer he could he could tell by look that's all this is saying when you see the signs know that the time is near the tribulation is about to begin but in relationship to the rapture people are, are, are told to look for christ not for signs but for christ first thessalonians chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 says now as to the times and epochs Brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Revelation 3.3 3 says, So remember, when you have received and heard and keep it and repent, therefore if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at the, what hour I will come to you. So first is the whole idea of his imminent return. Secondly, who populates the millennium? Isaiah 65, verse 2 says, No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his days, for the youth will die at the age of 100, and the the one who does not die or does not reach the age of 100 will be thought accursed. Now, this passage is a description of, of the life during the millennium. And from this verse, we see that people will live longer. In fact, it states that if you die at 100 years of age, then something's wrong. You are considered an infant. Nevertheless, follow this, people still 
die during the millennium. They still die. They'll have, why? Because they'll ha- there will be some in the millennium who have physical bodies. Uh, there, and there will be others of us, if we've been raptured, who will be living during that time, who will have metaphysical bodies. That means that we have, and I think, by the way, the, the prototypical body for the millennium and the rapture will be that of our Lord. And, of course, when our Lord was here on this earth, he had res- his resurrected body, I should say. What, 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 what were the dimensions or uh, characteristics, I should say? Well, he, he, could, he walked around. You could touch him. Told Peter, he told Thomas, touch, touch me. But he also could walk through walls and he could disappear at any moment. Our bodies will be like that, I believe. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 bases everything on the resurrection of Christ. He says, if Christ is not raised, we won't be raised. But if he is, we will. Um, so the answer is very clear. At the end of the tribulation, there will be two judgments, one for the Jews and one for, another for the Gentiles. That's the, by the way, that's what, you remember the verse that Jehovah Witnesses grab a hold of? He that endureth to the end, it's in uh, Matthew 24, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Well, it simply, it simply means because the tribulation is going to be so harsh, there are going to be so many people who die, including believers, mind you, and he simply is saying, if you happen to live, make it to the end of the tribulation alive, you will be saved. The word, the word saved means delivered. You have, to, you have to see the context. Anytime you see the word saved, don't assume that it's talking about the salvation moment when you trust Christ. The word means delivered. Sozo is the Greek word. Uh, and it means delivered. And so he says, if you, if, you, if you happen to make it to the end of the tribulation, and that's a big if you'll be delivered, if you're a believer, into the millennium. Now, if one holds to a post-tribulational view of the rapture, that is that, the, that Christ will rapture the church, and then he'll go back up, have the judgment seat of Christ, and then he'll bring all of us with him for the battle of Armageddon and for, again, his return. Now think about that. If, if Christ raptures, this, this really speaks to those who believe in a post-tribulational view. And by the way, I think the, the, the just my view, I believe the pre-wrath rapture view is simply a way to try to get around this. Uh, it's, a it's a glorified post-tribulational view, in my mind. Okay, I could be wrong. But nonetheless, if, if, if Christ comes and raptures the church right before he returns, then my question is, Who will be alive, believers, at the end of the tribulation, to be transferred into the millennium? Nobody. So, it would seem that only those who are believers living at the end of the tribulation would be allowed into the millennium, and those, again, uh, all the believers who have died will be transformed. By the way, the, the Old Testament saints who have, have been in the grave, they will be, people, I get this question all the time, when will the Old Testament saints, those who've trusted God in the Old Testament, when will they be resurrected? Or will they be resurrected? They will be resurrected as the millennium begins, or right before it begins. And all those who have gone will be resurrected, who have died, and will be given a glorified body. Now, I'm going to skip... On your outline, I I want to get to the end of this message. So I'm going to skip number three. What is the, when is the wedding? Really, it's an, I think the wedding really presents us with an analogy. The Jewish wedding, I should say, presents us with an analogy of the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ. And so, but I, I, I want to get on, move on here. Number four is the promise of exemption. First Thessalonians chapter one, it says, to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead that is Jesus who rescued us from the wrath to come the wrath to come the wrath to come is a literally in the Greek it's a present passive participle it literally is from the wrath that is coming so clearly it's talking about an event it's not talking about just a difficult time the word is used of God's general wrath against sin in Romans 1.18. It's also used 
of the wrath of the great tribulation in Revelation 6, chapter 14, chapter 15, and chapter 16. The word is never used in reference to hell or the lake of fire. Let me say it one more time. It's never used in conjunction to hell or the lake of fire. Now, some will come along and say, yeah, God will deliver us from the wrath to come by delivering us through the tribulation. You heard that argument before? I have. Let's examine that. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, let's go there. In 3, verse 10, it says, Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. He says, I will keep you. Now, he says, I'll keep you from the hour of testing. The word keep means to preserve or to protect. But what's most important, and, and by the way, the, the Greeks, how shall I describe it? The way they use prepositions. Preposition, by the way, in the Greek also be, can become a prefix. That's why there are over close to 200,000 Greek words. Hebrews about, the Hebrew language has about 10,000 words. The Greek has over 200,000 words. But largely because they use prepositional Prepositions to make uh, as a prefix on different words. But here, the word from is the Greek word ek. The word ek in the Greek means out of or out from within. Had John wanted to express protection through this period of tribulation, he would have more than likely used one of the two Greek prepositions, either in, which means in, or dia, which means through. But he used ek, which literally again means out of. So clearly to me, it is, I think it's unmistakable. He's talking about something that God is going to keep us out. And remember, this, this is written to the church, one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Now, another is the context, the context of the second advent. There's simply no place in Scripture, I don't have to say much here, there's simply no place in Scripture in which the rapture of the church is mentioned in the same context as the return of Christ. There's no place you find them back to back, nowhere. There's no reference to the church in Revelation chapter 6 through 18, uh, in the book of Revelation. So it would seem to me the church is not there. Another proof, I think, it's a chronology of Revelation. In, in Revelation chapter 4, you're right there, look back at chapter 4, verse 1. It says, after these things, I looked up. Now, what are these things? After the letter to the seven churches. Those letters were written to seven churches, seven different types of I mean, literal churches in that time. But they also represented uh, a mandate, or perhaps we'd say a um, a reprimand in some ways, to different churches of different types. And there are churches like any one of those today. But here, after that, he says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet, get that? Sound of a trumpet speaking with me. Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. And immediately... I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one was sitting on the throne. So John says, I had this vision, God, God says, come up and be with me. Now, he's talking to John, but this is, has somewhat of a, a double entendre meaning. You know what that is. That's a statement that can mean one thing, but it has kind of a secondary meaning. Let me give you a couple, a few. Or a few. For example, Include your children when baking cookies. A police, begin, a police begin campaign to run down jaywalkers. Glad I got somebody that laughed here. Uh, drunks get nine months in violin case. <laughs> Iraq head seeks arms. Iraqi head seeks arms. Uh, juvenile court to try shoot, uh, shooting defendant. 
All right. Man struck in lightning. Uh, man struck by lightning faces battery charge. <laughs> Local high school dropout cut in half. <laughs> That's bad. He's saying to John, look, come up and, and get a look at God's program from a divine viewpoint. But within that, he's, it, it's, it is a picture of the rapture. It's a picture of the rapture. How do I know that? Let me give you some reasons why. Number one, there's a door opening, meaning that one is coming up into heaven. Number two, it's associated with the sounding of a trumpet. Number three, the heavens open only twice in the book of Revelation. They open in this particular case, chapter 4, verse 1, and in Revelation 19.11. And in that passage, when the door opens, you see Jesus on a white horse. What does that symbolize? It means he's coming back, right? judgment number four verse four represents redeemed men and women who are glorified and crowned with rewards judgment seat has already taken place and number five the chronology is clearly at the end of the churches and before the unfolding of the tribulation now the, the last thing here is the the last trumpet now no one, I should say, now, one of the greatest arguments of the post-tribulational uh, person, whoever, is that which is presented in 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty-two, the one, the passage that was read by Mark. Go with me to 1 Corinthians uh, 15 real quickly here. In 1552, it states, At the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, and the dead will do what? The dead will be raised imperishable, and we will, we will be changed. Now, there are many of those who'd argue that this is the last trumpet, is the last of the, se- or this trumpet is the last of the seven trumpets that are blown by seven angels in the book of Revelation which seems reasonable on the surface, but not logical. Think of it this way. If you received a letter and it spoke of a last trumpet, how would you understand that last trumpet? Would you go to a book you've never read before? Would you kind of get it by osmosis? Or would you go back to what is most familiar to you at that time concerning trumpets? Well, if you look in Leviticus chapter, we won't go there, but in Leviticus chapter 23, it talks about six feasts. One had to do with a trumpet. In fact, in Isaiah 27, 12, and 13, it tells us that one trumpet is, is, uh, is fulfilled with Israel. In fact, they were told, uh, Moses, God told Moses to make two trumpets uh, of silver, One was supposed to be blown at the first of the month, seventh month. Why seven? Seven years in the tribulation. Seven is, of course, the sign of number of perfection. But also they were told to make two trumpets of silver. One was to be blown then, during this time. You can do the study. But another one would be at a later time. I would assume that the trumpet here in 1 Corinthians is just that second trumpet, and it has nothing to do with revelation and trumpet. And by the way, again, let me just say, if the Jews read about a trumpet, and for example, they hear Jesus speaking in the Olivet Discourse about a trumpet, where, where, where would their mind go? They've never heard of, the, of, of anything else. Their minds would go back to the, the numerous times, and remember, the, the blowing of the trumpet was an integral part of the culture of the Jews in the Old Testament. It was blown all the time for different reasons and different purposes. So their mind would have gone back to the Old Testament. So it, it's not here speaking of the second coming of Christ. I mean, of the rapture, I should say. That's often meant. It is in 1 Corinthians, but not in... Uh, Matthew 24, getting ahead of myself. 
Let me give you some application here. Number one, remember, God has a plan for you for the ages. God has a plan for not just for here, not just in heaven, but in the millennium as well as the new heaven and earth. By the way, you're going to have positions in the millennium. We get really caught up into the rewards that we are to receive at the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm all for that, okay? But the Bible constantly, and this is one of my great pet peeves of these pastors, they're not emphasizing this, over and over and over and over, Paul and Peter, they all say, John, they all say, live this life now in, in light of what's coming. Live this life in, what is, in light of what's coming. Part of the problem this won't cost you anything extra, but part of the problem here is that people want to say the church needs to be purified. And therefore, that's why we want them to go through a big part of the tribulation. Look, if you study the Bible and it says Jesus is coming again and one day you're going to stand with him face to face, that ought to be enough. Amen? You know what you had to say to me to get me to cor correct my life as a young guy? Wait till your dad gets home. And I remember one time as a young lad, I was on top of the garage and I was crying and giving everybody grief. And lo and behold, my dad turned into the driveway. You don't think I got straight quick, quickly. Listen, God has a plan for us, but we need to live this life in light of what's ahead of us. Number two, two, remember that the resurrection of Christ removes all feelings from our thinking. We don't have to feel about whether Jesus is going to come back. We know he will because the resurrection tells us he will come back. He will rapture his church. And number three, I must know Christ as my Savior to be a member of God's plan for the ages. You must know him as your Savior. Receive him as your Savior. Recognize that you are a sinner just like all of us. That Christ died in your place and in mine. In fact, the Greek word that's used often when it speaks of that is the Greek word "huper," which literally means in your place, my place. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus and God the Father, for promising us so such rich stuff. So rich, so wonderful. It's just sometimes hard to contain ourselves. We look forward, Lord, to that day when we all will put off those, these, these bodies and put on a new one, and we'll live eternally with you. Pray this in your son's name. Amen.